All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to BWI Talks Island SOS. And I'm William Campbell, your host for today's presentation. This eight-part series focuses on innovative, sustainable ocean development initiatives in island nations around the globe. Each presentation will cover a different island and a different topic, and will highlight the unique perspectives and involvement that islands have on ocean conservation, and will showcase the different practices that islands have undertaken to safeguard their surrounding ocean. BWI appreciates the, uh, the exclusive and generous support of Chubb Bermuda, the sponsor of this series. Island SOS aligns with Chubb's mission to promote a healthy and sustainable planet, to strengthen the resilience of communities, and to protect biodiversity against the effects of climate change. And today is the second presentation in our series, and we're very excited to have our uh, own local influencer, Faye Sapsford. Please give her a hand if we can. <laughs> we're going to be focusing on the work that she's undertaken uh, with the Sargasso Sea Commission, where she is a practicing research fellow, and locally with her Go Sea project as well. Faye supports the Commission of Science, Communications, Academic and Financial Tasks and Administerial Activities, and she also runs her own science communications-focused Instagram account, at Sargasso Girl. And Faye is also currently uh, pursuing a PhD in Maritime Affairs at the World Maritime University. So just before I turn over the, uh, the microphone and the floor to uh, Faye, I'd just like to ask her if she can uh, just talk a little bit about, uh, about the Sargasso Sea Commission and her, uh, her role within it. And then after that, then we'll, uh, we'll go through her presentation and then turn it over to the audience for some questions, too. Please give the floor to Faye. Cool. Yeah, thanks a lot, Will. And thanks, everybody, for coming um, Yeah, and spending your Sunday with me. I'm really excited to be here. Hopefully, I, yeah, I'm talking into the microphone right. Um, I just got back, actually, from my first uh, course at World Maritime University to start my PhD. So I literally flew in this morning. So I'm really glad everything worked out with the flight schedule. Um, and yeah, so. For my role at the commission, um, it's nice to have some context about what the commission is doing. Uh, the commission secretariat is pretty much made up of my boss, David, and me. So there's two people doing a lot of things in the commission. Um, of course, however, the main parts are our um, collaborators, the people that support us, so our scientific commission and our signatories are governmental signatories so we have scientists and governmental representatives oh sorry i gotta be i'm like <laughs> not in frame anymore i have to stay behind my podium <laughs> cool um so yeah thanks a lot will <laughs> and uh yeah so i'll go into my presentation now so i just wanted to talk a little bit about how we can protect the sargasso sea um and i'll talk a little bit a bit about uh, legal perspectives of that, um, and just about, you know, how cool the Sargasso Sea is and what things we can find in it. Cool. Um, oh, I need my little clicker. Cool. Um, great. So, you guys might have seen in the news recently that a high seas treaty was finalized last month, um, and this was really huge news for the Commission um, because we're so concerned with high seas issues. So this is a kind of emotional photo of President uh, Rena Lee. She's the president of negotiations for the BB&J Treaty, the High Seas Treaty. Um, it's also called, bi um, yeah, bi a bio Biology Beyond National Jurisdiction. That's the kind of acronym. But she's super emotional in this photo. She was kind of crying a bit because they finally finalized it. Um, and part of why she was crying was also probably because they had been negotiating for 36 hours straight at this point. So no one had really gotten any sleep. Um, and it's just so important because uh, it had been under negotiation for over a decade. Um, and it's the first internationally legally binding agreement for the high seas. Um, there's a ton of things contained within the BBNJ high seas agreement. Um, but what's significant for us is that it will allow marine protected areas to be established on the high seas for the first time. Um, and I'll kind of explain why that is uh, later in the presentation. So what does this mean for the Sargasso Sea? Uh, but let's, let's talk a bit first about kind of the legal side of this and what do we actually mean when we talk about the high seas? Um, so if you think about kind of a coastal state or an island state, it almost seems like the ocean is as important as the land. If you think about uh, cultural identity of the people there and access to resources, um, the ocean is kind of a significant part of people's lives who live on islands and coastal states. 
So the concept of an exclusive economic zone is kind of extending the borders of a country out into the ocean. So all the green parts on this map are exclusive economic zones of nations. Um, and the exclusive economic zone uh, extends 200 nautical miles from the coast of each state. So each state owns their little slice of the ocean. And you can see uh, island states like Bermuda, we might have a tiny land mass, but we have a huge exclusive economic zone. So it kind of feels like we're, we're an ocean state. We own much more of the ocean than we do of the land, which is kind of interesting. Um, so yeah. Each state has sovereign right to the things in their exclusive economic zone. Um, but what about beyond that, beyond these green areas in the map, we have the blue areas, which are what we call the high seas. So they're also called, the technical term is areas beyond national jurisdiction, uh, because they're beyond the boundaries of any one nation. Um, so this is kind of areas that are owned communally by all the countries in the world. Um, this is not just coastal states, but landlocked states as well. It's kind of seen as a common resource for everyone. That's the high seas. Uh, so, and we're talking about a huge area here. So the high seas are 43% of all the Earth's surface and 64% of all ocean space. It's the largest uh, biosphere um, in, on Earth. Um, so we can think a little bit about how we can actually visualize the high seas. I think when most people think about it, um, we think about this, you know, David Attenborough talking about the amazing game fish, like getting their prey into a bait ball and picking them off one by one. Um, but the high seas are not just, you know, surface ecosystems. Of course, we have some very cool surface ecosystems like Sargassum, uh, which floats at the surface and supports an interesting community of microfauna. Um, and then we have the sunlit areas of the ocean where we have huge game fish and tuna and swordfish and things like that. But we very quickly come into, you know, the midwater where animals start getting weirder and their bodies are adapted to pressure and they start making their own light and we get lower and lower all the way to the seabed. Um, so we're not just thinking about the sunlit ecosystems, but also all the way to the seabed um, in the high seas. And this is pretty crazy because the legal regimes for the high seas uh, split the seabed and the water column. And this might make sense to human lawmakers, but it doesn't really make sense to the animals that actually live there because the ecosystems are so connected. Um, so it's just kind of interesting. Uh, the seabed is kind of um, governed by the principle of the common heritage of mankind. Um, and the water column is governed by the principle of the freedom of the high seas. And we'll talk a little bit about this. It sounds kind of technical, but we'll break it down. But uh, important to note that the seabed is, has an international organization that governs uh, resource extraction, which is the International Seabed Authority. But activities in the water column uh, are pretty fragmented. There's a lot of different organizations that um, have mandates to, you know, uh, sustainably manage lots of different things in the water column. Um, so if we think a little bit about these principles, the common heritage of mankind um, and the freedom of the high seas uh, kind of seem to be at odds with each other because the freedom of the high seas is saying that uh, you have freedom to do certain things on the high seas. All states, no matter if you're landlocked or coastal, you can fish do whatever you want on the high seas. You can navigate through it, you can fly over it, you can do research, you can fish. The common heritage of mankind is kind of a stewardship principle saying, you know, there's some things on the earth that actually belong to everybody and, you know, we should make sure that everyone has equal access to them right now. So for example, it's not just maritime powers that have access to them. It's landlocked states that might not have a lot of resources to like get out there, but it's not just the people that are alive right now, but also into the future. So it has this conservation kind of ethos, and the other one is kind of a free market kind of ethos. Um, so they seem kind of opposite. Uh, so yeah, this is just to underscore the fact that the high seas have kind of 
because they're a commonly held resource, they've turned into a tragedy of the commons because it's really difficult to effectively manage them. And we've seen a little bit of that with uh, the principles we just talked about. Um, so yeah, it's kind of interesting because everyone wants you know, their piece of the resources on the high seas for sure, and they should have access to it. Um, but not a lot of people want to step up and you know, protect these spaces. Um, so yeah, just to underscore what the high seas gives us, it's really important to every person, it, not just people who live close to it, like we are lucky to do in Bermuda. So like I said, it's, it's a huge part of the planet's biosphere. Um, and it's of course havens for biodiversity, for game fish and ocean giants like great whales. It also produces huge amounts of oxygen for the air that we breathe. So every second breath comes from the ocean. And most of that is from the photosynthetic algae in the surface layer of the high seas. Um, they also regulate our climate and they absorb a lot of the excess heat generated by climate change. They have already done this. You know, if the seas didn't exist, we would be much further along in the climate change process because um, they've absorbed so much heat. And of course, they're the Earth's largest carbon sink. So if we kind of, you know, get complacent and lose the services the high seas provide, it's going to be catastrophic for climate change mitigation. Um, so to talk a little bit about human impacts, uh, the, because they're so remote, it's hard to get information about what's actually happening on the high seas. Um, and sometimes it seems that they're more pristine than inland ecosystems, but I kind of just want to underscore that it's important to manage ecosystems before they reach a crisis point which is kind of what we're trying to do. Um, so of course, uh, we have climate change and ocean acidification. Um, that's huge in the high seas. Um, and there's some bios colleagues here today. Uh, uh, the reason we know so much about this in the Sargasso Sea is because of the BATS um, time series study, which I think is like the oldest study for oceanographic measurements in the world. You guys can yeah, <laughs> tell me what the actual fact is, but we have a really long time series of temperature and ocean acidification increasing in the Sargasso Sea because of the work at BIOS. Um, we also have uh, plastics, threat of plastics on the high seas. You can see triggerfish here uh, sheltering in a plastic discarded barrel. Um, and it's to the point now that uh, it's crazy that plastic has kind of become an ecosystem in itself. And if you know Rebecca Helm, who's like a scientist we work with at, at GOSI, She's kind of uh, someone examining this, like the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is a huge problem, but it also provides you know, a floating ecosystem for these barnacles and hydroids to cling onto and for fish to shelter beneath. And it's really hard to you know, undo what we've done now because um, you know, it's been colonized by animals on the high seas. Um, ship traffic is also a huge issue. So we know that it can break up these huge mats of sargassum um, and there's also the, and that breaks up the ecosystem. We don't have a lot of information uh, in the Sargasso Sea about cetacean strikes and like noise pollution from ships that kind of, you know, affects their uh, communication, but it's probably happening. Um, there's also the threat of pollution and exotic species discharge through ballast water of ships. Um, and we have growing fishing activity in the high seas, in the Sargasso Sea. Um, again, like it's hard to get super accurate information, but we think that it might be kind of squid fishing going on, uh, and that could have knock-on effects for things that eat squid, like tuna. Um, deep sea mining is a huge issue that could have a whole other talk about it. Um, underwater cables, we explored this. Uh, a lot of these have already been laid, um, and like I said, uh, it's just important to manage these spaces before we kind of lose everything. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, sargassum, which is, yeah, the thing that we all love that maybe we all came here for. Um, you guys have all <laughs> probably seen it on the beach. And um, yeah, I, I want to change everyone's minds thinking that it's kind of an ugly or inconvenience on the beach because uh, it's just so important for us and our whole island. So sargassum is a hollow pelagic macroalgae. It floats on the surface, never attaches to the bottom at any stage in its life cycle. Um, and it provides this incredible uh, habitat on the high seas because in the boundless blue, 
that's the only place to shelter inside sargassum mats. Um, so yeah, these are some of the sargassum endemics. Uh, these are animals that live their whole lives in sargassum algae on the high seas. They have you know, camouflage and um, adaptations to blend in uh, and they stay tiny. Uh, so I think it's just really cool that on the high seas you have this whole ecosystem of microfauna that we kind of forget about. Um, so I think that's the coolest part for me. Uh, and then of course, sargassum underneath it um, also acts as a shelter for uh, the developmental stage of tons of fish species. Some of them are gonna grow to be ocean giants. So uh, this is a tiny dolphin fish, the green one, um, and it's gonna grow to be a huge sport fish. Um, but it a lot of times begins its life in sargassum sheltering in there. Um, we also have, you know, larger fish that are attracted to the mats to feed on the things that live in there, and it just creates this whole ecosystem. Um, yeah, also turtles as well. Uh, we know that the lost, the lost years, what used to be the lost years of turtles, um, after they leave the nesting beach, we now know that a lot of Atlantic turtle species uh, swim out to the high seas and they develop in sargassum. It's kind of like a warm little safe nursery for them. And then a lot of them come to Bermuda, like we see with the Bermuda Turtle Project for intermediate stage turtles. Um, in addition, uh, the Sargasso Sea is the only breeding ground for two species of anguillid eel. Um, so this is the American and European eel. And Bermuda doesn't have a huge relationship with them, but uh, a lot of um, American and European locations do. They're really culturally important and um, they're widely you know, consumed by humans. Um, and they're critically endangered. Uh, and oh, to just explain, oh, if I can go back a tiny bit more. Um, yeah, so they're catadromous. So they begin life in salt water and transition to freshwater environments. And that's why we don't see the adult eels. Um, but this is one, one of the adults that got trapped in Spittle Pond, I believe, and it couldn't get out and grew to maturity. Um, yeah, and then we also have the Sargasso Sea as a uh, migratory corridor for uh, whales um, and other cetaceans and sharks and rays. Um, oh yeah, and then also the Neustin. So this is a really interesting group of animals that live on the high seas, um, not just, you know, uh, not just the Sargasso Sea, but a lot of high seas areas. Um, and this is, Neustin is the term that we give to animals that live right on the surface. So a Portuguese man of war is a good example. It floats on the surface. Uh, this is a sea skater, so it's an insect. It's like a pond skater, but for the ocean. Um, and then, yeah, various other snails and barnacles too. Um, and this is what we look for in the Go Sea project, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, yeah, so if we're thinking about barriers to high seas conservation, like I said, uh, remoteness is a big challenge because it's hard to gather data, like who's actually going out there. Um, we can do a little bit with drifters and satellites, but we kind of need ground truthing of that as well. It's difficult and it's expensive. Um, also, when we think of from the legal side, uh, sometimes there can be lack of political support for proposals um, through the organizations that are available or lack of political will to ac actually implement the things that we agree. Um, also, you know, like I mentioned in the beginning, the High Seas Treaty is significant because it's internationally legally binding. Um, a lot of these treaties that we have right now that exist over different parts of the, of the oceans, um, not every country is, has signed up to be part of it. So they can make a measure, but people who haven't signed up to it can just still do whatever they want. Um, and yeah, of course, there's difficulty of enforcement on the high seas, uh, same challenges because it's so remote. Um, and the biggest one that we've hopefully solved now is the lack of internationally legally binding structures for protection. Um, but I do have to quickly mention that uh, the high seas treaty that we're all very excited about, if I just go back, the high seas treaty, uh, the text has been finalized, but it has not been ratified by, um, by states. And that's a process that could take years. So it could take years to actually come into force. Um, so just to give some context about how fragmented, you know, the governance of the high seas is, um, I'll try and explain this diagram of the Sargasso Sea. So the only legally binding measure 
that the Sargasso Sea has been able to put in place in this fragmented system is a measure through NAFO, so the Northwest Atlantic Fisheries Organization. Um, and you can see that, you know, NAFO uh, has a mandate to regulate fishing in the high seas, but it has a very defined geographic area. So the yellow box is where NAFO protections apply. And you can see it's only a thin sliver at the top of the Sargasso Sea. So we've been able to achieve something, but uh, you know, we couldn't go further because NAFO's convention doesn't extend <laughs> to where we want it to extend. Um, so on the, on the left there, you can see um, just all the organizations that have competency over the Sargasso Sea, and they all have different criteria. So you might be able to do something about shipping through IMO. You might be able to do something about tuna fishing through ICAT, um, but they're all in their individual silos. We don't have anything that's holistic um, until now where we can hopefully you know, go from an ecosystem perspective and potentially create a marine protected area instead of going through these like human created uh, sectors. So yeah, just to uh, wrap up as well, um, I'll explain a little bit about the commission. Um, yeah, the commission is really on the cutting edge of high seas protections. Like it's been in operation for over a decade um, and its kind, its kind of purpose was to test how far how far can we go in ocean protection within this fragmented system where we have these different instruments for different sectors and different areas of the ocean. You know, we have this iconic area with sargassum. Like people love it. Like how far can we go? <laughs> and you can see, after a decade, I think the relation the relationships we've built and the questions we've been able to ask are really incredible. But now is the time when we can actually go and make some more binding protection measures, possibly because of the finalization of this high seas treaty. And the work of the commission over the years has kind of backed up the need that you know we should, we should actually have a holistic treaty for the high seas. So anyway, the commission um, was established in 2014, um, as we know it now, um, when various states signed the Hamilton Declaration uh, for collaboration on conservation of the Sargasso Sea. There's Sylvia Earle, she's a really prominent uh, biologist celebrating, uh, she was the first to call uh, Sargassum a golden floating rainforest. And uh, the role of the commission um, is to exercise a stewardship role for the Sargasso Sea to keep its health um, and resilience under review. Um, and we, I'll just show uh, kind of the structure that I spoke about in the beginning. We have our you know, incredible scientific experts, um, and those are the Sargasso Sea Commissioners. So there's seven of them, and they change, like their terms expire periodically, but their role is to really give technical scientific advice about um, you know, oceanography and ecology. And then we have our governmental signatories, um, who are politicians, decision makers, governmental representatives who can help us uh, champion protection measures in international fora. So the commission is really um, unique because the commissioners, the scientists, are not representatives of the signatory governments. So they're independent and it gives them some more freedom. Um, and yeah, this is just kind of to summarize what I've been saying. Uh, this is the commission trying to go as far as we possibly can in the existing legal regime. Um, but I hope that these are the things we've achieved so far, but I hope that we can go farther and perhaps we could become the first high seas MPA created under the BBNJ treaty. Um, so yeah, I'm coming to the end of my presentation now, but this is just um, my little plug for our beachcombing group, which is go see, uh, because I think m when, I, when I go through this presentation, like it seems very, uh, you know, apart from the average person, it's all these like, you know, international conferences and like legal regimes. Um, and people are wondering what can they do as an individual to help the high seas and to, you know, um, support the commission. Um, I think citizen science is a really cool way uh, to get involved and to feel like you're part of it. Um, and what we're doing with Go See is kind of beachcombing, uh, seeing what high seas animals we find that wash up um, and then putting those as data points on iNaturalist um, so that we can solve questions about how animals move on the high seas and potentially questions about their natural history, 
because a lot of these animals, like I said, they're so remote that we just know really little about them, like, you know, how Portuguese men were reproduce and things like that. Very basic questions. So yeah, this is just my little plug for that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'd like to open it up to a Q&A now. And uh, thank you so much for listening to me. And I'll do my best to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, Faye. Um, yeah, please come back and uh, take the floor again because it's all yours. But um, I'm just going to come around and uh, just take uh, some questions from whoever uh, would like to uh, present. Uh, for the sake of our recording here, I'm going to ask Faye to uh, just repeat your question very briefly uh, just before she goes ahead and gives her answer, just so that the uh, folks who are listening uh, on the internet can uh, can hear it as well. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'll have to go back and, oh, sorry, okay. First, I'm going to ask the question again, repeat the question. So um, you're wondering how, who, who will actually be involved in creating a high seas MPA under the BBNJ treaty? Um, and yeah, I'll have to go back and review the text. I know that it's going to take, I believe, 60 states to, to ratify it, so to get the treaty going. Um, the responsibility for designating MPAs is going to be uh, by the Conference of the Parties, um, that this treaty will uh, establish. So like we have for the UNFCCC, the climate change um, treaty, we have a conference of the parties where all the time people yeah, come and um, politicians will get together and make agreements. Um, so I think I, I was looking at some of the um, negotiations and there were some delegations that were pushing for consensus. So everyone has to agree and then there were some that were pushing for a rule where I believe it's like two thirds majority. Um, and then there was this controversial opt out provision uh, that was introduced kind of late in the game where, you know, some, some delegations were saying, you know, this is going to like scupper the whole treaty. Like if you say, okay, we're going to agree in MPA, but then some states can come along and be like, okay, well, I'm going to opt out of it, even though this is an internationally legally binding thing. Um, so yeah, it's kind of it's kind of up in the air. I'm going to have to review if it's consensus or two thirds, but the opt out thing exists, which is kind of not ideal in my book. Yeah, thanks a lot, Robbie. So the question was kind of what what are the criteria uh, for establishing an MPA? Like, do we do we have those? Like, how are people going to fulfill them? Um, and I think this is I think this is great because a lot of work has already been done on these criteria. Um, they included some in the agreement. I, yeah, they included some. So they've already agreed what the criteria are for like something to be, um, you know, considered an MPA. I'm sure there's also going to be deliberations in conference with the parties. But um, going back to one of my previous slides, the commission has a designation under the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is a UN instrument, um, saying that it's an ecologically or biologically significant area. It's an EBSA. So um, there were a ton. This is not an internationally like legally binding measure or anything. It's just kind of to say, hey guys, like we did all this scientific work, and like we're like we're saying like <laughs> this is an important area. So the, the EBSA process has a bunch of criteria that somewhere has to, uh, you know, fit to be considered an EBSA. So I think that's also a good starting point and the EBSA criteria are very similar to what's in the treaty. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, so the question was about um, what do I think about the explosion of sargassum in the ocean? And um, this is a really important question because, yeah, what I seem to be saying contradicts everything in the news. Like, hey, guys, like we should like sargassum, like we should protect it. And meanwhile, in the news, we see these catastrophic sargassum blooms that, you know, cause, you know, they smother ecosystems and they disrupt tourism in the Caribbean and they even cause health issues um, in some respects. Um, so I think it's important for me to, yeah, emphasize that like our experience of sargassum in Bermuda is very different to that of the Caribbean uh, because Bermuda is like, it's the only landmass within the Sargasso Sea um, and sargassum is supposed to be here. And like, it's, it's beneficial for our beaches and, you know, recruiting animals to our reefs. Um, in the Caribbean, they have a completely opposite experience because um, the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt, this harmful algal bloom, like my understanding of it is that it doesn't originate in the Sargasso Sea. It's like two separate populations of sargassum. Um, so the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt, uh, they think it's fed by, I think, human introduced pollution, like sewage runoff and things. Um, and it's, it's basically an invasive species. Uh, whereas in Bermuda, it's supposed to be here. So, um, yeah, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. If I, you know, if I gave this presentation in the Caribbean, it, it would be very, you know, like it would just come off very badly. So, yeah, it's important to make that distinction. You know, we have totally different experiences of it. Yeah, thank you. So it was just a comment about, you know, we should reposition it as something positive. Um, and I think that's definitely able to be done, especially in Bermuda. Uh, but I will quickly say that, you know, some people talk about sargassum sinking as a way to, um, you know, sequester carbon. And I, I have mixed opinions about that. So we'll see <laughs> how that goes. <laughs> Yeah, sure. So the question was just about um, deep sea mining. Um, and this this high seas treaty uh, won't really affect regulations that we already have on deep sea mining because it's um, it's totally under the mandate and the remit of the International Seabed Authority. Um, and this treaty makes a really, the high seas treaty that's just been like agreed, uh, makes a really big point of acknowledging instruments that already, already exist. So it's not trying to replace everything. It's just trying to like, help people. So yeah, the International Seabed Authority is in charge of regulating deep sea mining. Um, right now, it seems like it's not going to be a huge threat in the Sargasso Sea because we don't have a lot of valuable things, it seems. Like, you know, the nodules that they're going after for these precious metals. Um, however, you know, yeah, I, this is very much my own opinion. I think, you know, deep sea mining is a terrible idea. And like, if it started anywhere in the ocean, it would affect ecosystems far and wide because of the sediment plumes that they're gonna be generating by like scraping the stuff off the high seas and extracting it. So if uh, seabed mining happened, um, you know, uh, in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, it would probably uh, affect the Sargasso Sea a lot, even though it's just adjacent. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. So the question was about, you know, if we have this international treaty, um, do I think it will increase interest in uh, more governments being part of the Hamilton Declaration for the Sargasso Sea or, or less? And what do I think about that? Um, and yeah, this is interesting. I haven't thought about this a huge amount, but I do think that, uh, yeah, I think the Sargasso Sea Commission is such a mature conservation effort that I think 
it will probably increase government um, interest because we've already done a, a lot of work and we have these meetings all the time where they can, you know, become like the on like first on the ground stakeholders to the Sargasso Sea and really shape um, what we're doing. Like, I think the commission has a really strong voice in any MPA that would be established. So I think governments, uh, if they're interested in the High Seas Treaty, uh, would also want to be part of the Hamilton Declaration if they feel connected to the commission, because it's the commission who I think would shape that proposal and governance, governments want to have a voice in doing that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thanks. So the question was, um, does the BBNJ Treaty uh, create a framework for countries to come together and create MPAs, or are there other aspects? Um, and yeah, so <laughs> the BBNJ Treaty, I should have emphasized this a bit more, is not just about MPAs and like the way it was covered in the news made that seem like that's all it was. And like, yeah, that's pretty important to me. Like, that's the part I care about too. But like, uh, it also includes provisions on marine genetic resources, uh, environmental impact assessments, and capacity building. And these are all multifaceted issues uh, on the high seas. Um, but it, it is just a framework for, for all of these things. Like it's just kind of saying, yeah, we should address this in a holistic way and have a forum uh, and some regulations about the high seas. Um, and then governments will have to deliberate and see how you know these are actually implemented in practice. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of different aspects to it. And marine protected areas, I think marine protected areas and capacity building, I think, were the parts of the agreement that were agreed most easily. And then marine genetic resources was the one where that made them stay up for 36 hours because it's it's a um it's an issue of you know maritime powers, the way I see it, like maritime powers wanting to keep their ability to just kind of do whatever they want on the high seas, like they have the resources to you know, get to these valuable marine genetic resources first, like discover new medicines from creatures living on the deep sea. And they don't really want to share that with other states, uh, even though the high seas are meant to be for everyone. So that was the conflict of marine genetic resources, like less developed states were saying, you should really share the benefits of this with everyone. And maritime powers were saying, actually, we want to keep doing it, how it's benefited us. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. So the question was about, you know, how how much how many studies have been done and how much do we actually know about how the Sargasso Sea functions as an ecosystem and what valuable resources it can give us. Um, and I will say that, yeah, the high seas are so remote, but I feel like the Sargasso Sea is one of the places we know the most about in the high seas, simply because this initiative has been going on for so long and we've had, you know, scientists interested in it. So I know for sure we have a ton of information about uh, ocean acidification and climate change, um, principally based on BIOS data. Um, and in terms of valuation, we have done an ecosystem valuation in the past. Um, this didn't look at uh, resources, though, mineral resources. Um, it was more like, you know, Sargasso Sea is, you know, providing uh, ecosystem services, like it's the breeding ground for all these eels, it's the breeding ground for all these tuna, like it's a migratory corridor, uh, you know, supporting biodiversity, which mitigates climate change. Um, but there was like, you know, actual economic value put to that. Um, I haven't like seen studies about uh, seabed minerals and resources specifically, but I'm pretty sure they exist because like I've heard it talked about that, you know, 
the Sargasso Sea was, was looked at, but they didn't really find anything that was valuable. So it's not really a threat right now. Thanks, mom. That was my mom. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so the question was about uh, go see um, and beachcombing. Because, yeah, I do a ton of beachcombing. And if you guys follow my Instagram account, uh, yeah, that's what, I, that's what I love to do. Um, and I just explained it a little bit. But um, the, whole, the whole idea of go see is to get uh, citizen scientists engaged in learning about the high seas. Um, and it's all through iNaturalist, which I kind of describe as a social media platform for ecologists, um, because <laughs> what you pretty much do is take photos of species that you see, and then you put it on iNaturalist as an observation, and other people can comment and uh, verify the species, like verify your identification of whatever it is. Um, and then the data is all public, all these, you know, uh, species and geographic locations where they were found and conditions and things like that. Um, so scientists can come along and use this really useful uh, community-driven data to answer questions um, rather than collecting the data themselves, which, you know, can be time-consuming and, uh, you know, financially burdensome as well. So, yeah, go see is all about inspiring people to want to look at weird stuff that washes up on the beach. <laughs> so if I go back to the Newston slide and the Sargassum microfauna, like this is what we find most of is, um, sorry, I don't know, this thing is like lagging a tiny bit. <laughs> but anyway, what we find a lot of is the Sargassum microfauna, uh, which is really fascinating to me. Like a lot of people um, have never, never seen or even known that these weird animals wash up in Bermuda. Um, but if you look closely, like they're right there, like all in the Sargassum, like washing in with the tide. Uh, these animals that seem so alien to us. Um, yeah, and I just think they're fascinating. So uh, I already talked a little bit about this little sea skater. Um, so it's just like a pond skater, like using the surface tension of the water, but it's on the open ocean. Like that's pretty crazy. It's the only high seas insect. You don't think about a tiny insect being able to survive out there, but you know, they're um, super numerous. And then this purple sea snail, it's actually a carnivorous sea snail. It secretes a mucus like bubble raft. Uh, so it floats upside down on the surface of the water and it actually eats uh, Portuguese man o' war. So the little snail, you can't see it in this picture, but the little snail comes out and like, you know, feasts on the, <laughs> on the man o' war because they're both floating. Um, and then this barnacle, it's called a, a buoy barnacle. And I just thought it was very weird. Like they can just float around on their own. Like this one's actually attached to a skeleton of a by the wind sailor, but they're a barnacle that can just float around on its own, which you don't think of a barnacle doing. But. Yeah, thanks for the question. So it was about, um, you know, American and European anglid deals. And, uh, you know, the Sargasso Sea is their only breeding ground. So are the countries that kind of eat them and use them participating? Um, and I will say that one of the big, um, I think, yeah, really significant things that the commission has done is organize uh, range states workshops for, for these eels. So um, these are for you know, places where the eels end up. So it's uh, the Americas and Europe, um, those, those states like where the eels, you know, live when they reach adulthood and they go into rivers, it's those states. Uh, and we bring them together to collaborate on uh, scientific information that they have and, you know, just to try and like manage them more sustainably. So I think that's uh, really impactful because it's really hard to protect an animal that is so transboundary. Um, However, uh, yeah, I think probably a big, a big issue for the eels is that they get taken uh, and then put in aquaculture um, in 
some Asian states. Um, and we don't, we don't work with a lot of Asian states, but that would be really interesting because that's kind of the bottleneck where all the eels are going. The glass eels, when they're caught in rivers, a lot of them are going to aquaculture in Asia. Yeah, thanks for the question. So it was about um, if people send drones or sail drones into the Sargasso Sea. Um, and I don't actually know a lot about this. Maybe BIOS colleagues or JP can talk more about this um, because I know there's efforts to do it, but I'm not super familiar with it. Um, but sail drones and satellites provide a huge amount of, of data on the high seas like because we can't really get out there. That's our primary source of data. Um, so yeah, maybe talk later to JP or BIOS people more. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so the question was just about um, the Sargasso Sea's relationship to Bermuda and how important it is for our island. Um, and yeah, I think this is a good place to kind of highlight um, because I always think like in Bermuda, we are really uniquely placed. Like we are pretty much a high seas state. Like not a lot of other islands can say that because they're closer to other islands or closer to the coast. Like if you go out in Bermuda and like drive in a boat for like 30 minutes, you're like pretty much in the high seas, which is really difficult to achieve in like every other state. Um, so I just think, uh, you know, I get so excited about all this stuff that washes up on the beach. You wouldn't be able to find this in most other places. And I think uh, it really has the power to strengthen our relationship with the high seas. Like I mentioned, you know, it's, it's kind of this invisible, like ephemeral place that not a lot of people can relate to, and yet it provides these incredible ecosystem services like providing oxygen and mitigating climate change. But a lot of people, I think, just don't feel a relationship with it. But we can in Bermuda because, you know, we're, we're right there. Like, it's our ocean backyard. So I think that's really cool. And that's just like my personal feeling of relationship with it. But in terms of what it gives to Bermuda, um, like I briefly mentioned uh, the sargassum that washes up on our beaches. Um, it, it actually stabilizes our shoreline. So it has like the power to fight erosion. Uh, so, you know, I, I know it's important like to clear it away for the tourists, but I'm always kind of like, oh, like let it be a sand dune, like <laughs> so we don't keep shrinking. But like uh, aside from that, um, you know, Bermuda's connection to the high seas uh, means that, you know, that's our pathway to recruit animals to the reef. So, you know, a ton of animals start their life as really tiny microscopic planktonic larvae. Like for example, a lot of crabs and lobsters actually start their life as free, free floating larvae on the high seas. And then they might be swept into Bermuda where they, you know, take up a benthic lifestyle and grow to maturity. So the Sargasso Sea recruits a ton of animals to our platform as well. Yeah, thanks for the question. So it was kind of about the management of sargassum uh, and what, what we should do. Uh, yeah, I think it's probably not my place to comment on that, especially for Caribbean states. Um, you know, I think a lot of Caribbean states are, are exploring this idea of sargassum sinking. Um, it's a totally different, you know, scenario there because it's so harmful for them, their tourism, their health. Um, I, I don't think sargassum sinking is a good idea, but uh, I understand why it's being done. 
Um, I think in Bermuda, the main thing is just, you know, I want people to know that things live in here and that like it came from the high seas and it's crazy. Like sometimes we do go see beachcombing meetups um, and random people will come say like, oh, what are you doing? Like in the sargassum and we'll show them like things that we find and they're like, you know, I've lived here my whole life and I never knew that this stuff was found on the beach. And I just wish uh, everybody knew about it and was as excited about it as I am. <laughs> now come to the end of our time uh, for today, unfortunately. And uh, thank you so much, Faye. I, I'm sure all of us learned uh, so much more than we ever anticipated learning uh, today about sargassum and about the implications of it for our, uh, for our own lives. Um, once again, uh, we do thank uh, Chubb, the sponsor of our series, and uh, we'll invite you guys back again every uh, first Sunday of every month until October. Next month, we are also hosting uh, J.P. Skinner, also from Bermuda, uh, with the Water Start Foundation, uh, exploring their work on Paget Island as well. Once more, if we can have one more round of applause for our wonderful input, Sir Fay. And once more, we invite you to, uh, to participate in, uh, in the GOSI uh, Beach pro uh, Coming programs and also to uh, follow her social media handles at, at Sargasso Girl and please address uh, any further questions you may have to her as well. Thank you very much, and we uh, hope to see you again very soon.